You know, sometimes I think we forget what worship is, why we sing as God's people. We're commanded to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And even that simple phrase, that chorus we just sang, worthy is your name. It's good that we do that together. Because we live in a culture that's all kinds of other names demanding to be praised. And as followers of Jesus, we come together and we are reminded as we lift our voices and say, no, 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 there's only one God. And it's not the gods of our culture. It's not the gods of, our, our, of the economy, of the gods that, that clamor for allegiance of our heart. It's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ and only he is worthy. His name is worthy. And so when we praise him, we're, we remind each other and we praise God. And as we do that, God, the psalmist says, inhabits our praise and something good happens in our hearts. So even if I never preach, which I'm going to do, don't worry, we still, we still are blessed as we worship his name together. Speaking of our church, uh, if you're new and you're visiting with us, as Kim mentioned, you can stop by the welcome desk. We'd love to get to know you. There's so much happening in the life of Chapel Street Church. Much of it I'm barely aware of. People assume I know everything, and that's clearly not true. But one of the things I want to make you aware of is a little story about a girl named Elsa Schulte. You'll see an image of Elsa here on the screen. This is Elsa. She's part of our Masterpiece ministry. Masterpiece, if you don't know, is a ministry designed to uh, bless and meet the needs of families and children with disabilities. Uh, who face unique challenges, who are precious in the eyes of God and part of the family of God. And Anitra, Elsa's mother, says there are very few things that Elsa and her sisters can all do together. But one of those things is the combination of Masterpiece Ministry and Elevate. Elevate is another ministry of Chapel Street Church. It's, for, uh, it's, it's a worship arts ministry. They recently had the production of Aladdin. And you'll see the next image here. You'll see there Elsa as part of Aladdin with her sisters. Elsa was not just an other in this production. She was one of the townspeople of Agrabah, as, as all the other kids were. And I just, the reason I tell you that story is because it's, it's, it's not something that perhaps you see or know about every day, but, what, but it's part of what God is doing in our midst, to reach families, to bless them, to give them, to give them a sense of their place and belonging in the family of God. And the reason I tell you that story is for those of you that are generous to the mission of God here at Chapel Street Church, your generosity, sometimes I think perhaps you grew up uh, in a church where giving was a guilt trip. If If you're new, if you're a guest, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. But if you're a regular contributor, God uses your contributions to further his work in our midst. And among those things are ministries like Elevate and Masterpiece. So I want to say thank you on behalf of our church family and families like Elsa's family for what you make possible through your generosity. Next week, we begin a series called The Road to Resurrection. Uh, it's hard to believe, but in three weeks, we'll celebrate Easter. It doesn't feel like it outside. Uh, I flew back from Arizona visiting my parents and a group of pastors that I'm, I visit with a couple times a year. And on the flight back, I thought, why, why, why do I live here? <laughs> why do we have a, ca- a campus in Arizona? Right. But uh, as we come back, I'm excited to celebrate Easter together, and it's only a few weeks away. And this next series, Pastor John Dixon, uh, who you've heard before, will be giving a two-week series on how can we trust the the accounts of the New Testament? Are they reliable? And what difference does the resurrection make? And is there evidence for the reality of the resurrection? The Apostle Paul says, if Christ is not raised, your preaching is useless, and you're still in your sins. So apparently the resurrection is a pretty big deal. And understanding if we can trust it, is important for us. So the road to resurrection, can we trust the New Testament accounts and what difference does it make as we approach Easter to celebrate the risen King together? Hope you'll make plans to join us for that entire series. Um, Now, today we're at the end of our series called The Gospel in Genesis. We've been in this series for a number of weeks looking at the gospel, the good news in Genesis, the beginning. The gospel doesn't begin in Matthew 1 or John chapter 1. It begins back in the beginning. The good news of Jesus Christ was God's plan before time. We've seen that God is the almighty creator of all that exists. He made all that is by the word of his power and all things hold together by his word, including us. He made creation and all that he made is good because he is good and he made it. And he made us as the crown of his creation in his image. We are image bearers of God, uniquely above all creation made to reflect the image of God in his creation. And we do that when we are in right relationship with him. And even we see God's goodness, not just in his creation, but in his commands, in his instructions about how we're to live. So we see God's goodness in creation, 
in how he made us and in his commands about how we are to live. But we would not have it. We chose to reject that and decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. This is the height of arrogance, what the Bible calls sin. Not just a wrong choice, but something in us that wants to determine for ourselves, be our own God, what is right and what is wrong. And that has led to our undoing, to fear, to hiding, to shame, to corruption, not only of ourselves and of our relationships, but of all of creation itself. All of this brings us to the final verses of Genesis chapter 3. Before we get to that, I want to read to you this quote from C.S. Lewis's essay, God in the Dock. Dock is the word for the witness stand, in case you're wondering. Listen to what he says. Ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are quite reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. He is quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he's ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. You hear what he's saying? It's so common today to hear people say things like, I can't believe in a God who would fill in the blank, allow this or permit that, or say this, or say that, as if God must answer our questions, right? We're the ones who determine what's right and what's wrong, and God must give an account for himself to us if we're to decide whether or not we're going to believe and let alone obey what God says, as if we could put God on trial. That doesn't mean it's wrong to have questions. doesn't mean that God is upset with our questions. What it means is we're the ones in the dock not God. When we come to Genesis chapter 3, we find out that God is not the one being questioned. He's the questioner. We are the ones being questioned. We're the ones being examined. We don't like this very much, but it's how the scriptures paint the reality of things. And by the way, your perspective matters when it comes to reading the Bible. Too many of us approach the Bible as if, I want to extract some inspiration for my life from this book. And I'll decide what I believe and what I obey, thank you very much, based on my sense of what's right and wrong. That's going back to the tr problem in the beginning. Rather than coming and saying, God, I admit to you that I'm kind of a wreck, and I don't see everything, and I'm open, and I'm humble, and I want to hear from you. With that said, let's pray before we read from Genesis 3. Father, we confess that sometimes we want to put you on trial. It's easier for us. It's more comfortable for us. But the truth is, we're the ones who need to be questioned and examined. And your word does that, if we allow it. So in this moment, we open ourselves and ask you to speak to us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the last few verses of Genesis chapter 3, the last text of our series, The Gospel in Genesis. This is uh, the continuation, by the way, of God's pronouncement of judgment, the inevitable results of our rebellion against him. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the, pl the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, there's a lot happening here in this passage, a lot going on. 
uh, that we're going to try to unpack and make sense of. God is uh, continuing on in the, what we call the curse, but it doesn't mean, as we said last week, like his, uh, he's just arbitrarily cursing things. He's declaring the inevitable results of our rebellion against him to the man and the woman and to creation here we see. Now, look at these two passages in, con- in contrast here, verses Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Don't eat the tree because you'll die, right? Look at verses 6 through 7 of chapter 3. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and there was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What do you notice there? There's lots of things. God says, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. If you do, on that day you'll die. They do eat of it, and what happens? They don't die. At least not immediately. Do you notice that? Was God not telling the truth? What are we to make of this? Well, Spiritually speaking, death doesn't just mean dropping dead physically. Death does now come in that they are no longer have access to the tree of life. They're not protected from the law of entropy. They're going to physically die. But that's not even the primary point. Death, biblically speaking, is about much more than your physical life. It's about alienation from God, separation. Four ways we look at this. Social alienation, psychological alienation, physical alienation, and then spiritual alienation. We'll talk about these. Social. What do they do when they sin? The first thing they do, their eyes are opened, they realize they're naked, and they sew together fig leaves. I've never tried that, but it seems like it would be inadequate to cover themselves. And it is. Now, they've been naked the whole time. What's the, all of a sudden, there's an awareness. I must hide myself. I must cover myself from one another. There's a social alienation, separation from one another that is a result of their sin, brokenness. Even verse 16, which says to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, people in the church debate this, what it means, and, and, and I think we miss the point. Here's the primary point God is making. He designed men and women to be mutual partners together, to help one another glorify God and achieve their God-given purpose. And now, because of sin, that relationship is broken. Now, instead of our harmonious partnership where they both fulfill their role to honor God, they're wrestling for control. They're fighting against one of each other. They're resenting each other. There's ruling over and wanting to usurp. And the whole thing is not as it was intended to be. Social alienation. That's not just a husband and wife. That's in human relationships. And if you haven't experienced that, you've got your head in the sand or just give it time. We've all experienced it. Second, psychological alienation. They cover up fear and shame and hiding. The deep sense that something's wrong with me, that I'm not as I should be. Despite what popular psychology tells you, self-help books will tell you, you know, just believe in yourself, trust yourself. Actually, spiritually speaking, it's a good thing to recognize I should be different and better than I am, but I'm not. I'm aware of it. I'm not at ease with myself. And there's physical alienation. Like, cursed is the ground because of you. Sweat. Toil. By the way, sweat. I sweat all the time. I'm sweating right now. You just can't even tell, right? I, I sweat all the time. In heaven, we won't sweat. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Meaning toil, sweat, difficulty, struggle, thorns, thistles. All that was meant to be easy and good is now a struggle in life. The physical world itself is broken and our relationship with it. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, all creation groans to be set right. Creation itself is groaning because of our sin and rebellion. And all of this, the first three are result of number four, spiritual alienation. We are 
cut off from God. Not completely forever, but our relationship of harmony with him is now broken because of our sin. Everything flows from that. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet has this vision of God in his temple. He says, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the whole earth was full of his glory. What was Isaiah's response to that? Seeing the glory of God. Sweet, cool. No. He says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Coming into contact with the holiness of God now causes us to recoil. Because we are aware that we are not holy. We are not right. Or in Luke chapter 5, right? When Peter's in the boat and there's the miraculous catch with Jesus and he realizes that this is the God, what does he say? Awesome! We can market this for a fishing business. That's not what he says. What does he say? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. There's this awareness, though we want to be near God, we recognize we cannot approach him because of our sin. Now, if you've never experienced that, if you've never had the internal sense that you're not right, longing to be near God, but recognizing that He is holy and you are not, I've talked to people, you know, I've never had that. I just think God is love, and He loves and accepts me, and I feel warm and fuzzy near Him. God is love, but He's also holy. If, that's never, if you've never had that sense, I would just suggest gently that perhaps that's a God of your own imagination. That's a God of your projection, not the God of the Scriptures. Frederick Beatner in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel is Fairy Tale, Tragedy, and Comedy, said, before the Gospel can be truly good news, it must be bad news. We've got to face the fact we're not as we should be. We're broken. We've rebelled. We've turned away. And there are consequences of that. If you ask the average person if they believe in God, many still say yes. But if you ask them, do you believe in the God of of justice, of judgment, who punishes sin? I prefer to think of God as. And we wrestle with how can God be both loving and merciful and compassionate and gracious and forgiving and and just and punish sin, and judge. We separate the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Perhaps you've done this in your own mind. Jesus seems nice. He's, like God in the Old Testament is grumpy and kind of angry, but Jesus has sweet hair and he's really cool and he likes people. That's That's a dichotomy we're forcing. We see at the cross, quite frankly, we'll see this in a few weeks, the perfect reconciliation of God's justice and his punishing of sin and his forgiveness and mercy. But actually here in Genesis 3, we see those things coming together as well in a powerful way. Christian Smith said, the the religion of our day is therapeutic, moralistic deism. Think about that. Therapeutic, it makes me feel good. Moralistic, be a good person. Deism, God in a general vague sense. Or as um, the author of the book, Um, Habits of the Heart writes, recording this uh, account of, I think her name is Sheila Larson, and she recounts her own faith and how she thinks of God. And this is, I think, descriptive of how a lot of our culture thinks about God. She's a young nurse, received a good deal of therapy, describes her faith as Sheilaism. She says, I'm not a religious fanatic. Notice, by the way, anytime any, any, any strong statement of belief seems to imply fanaticism, so you have to sort of offset that. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism, just my own little inner voice. It's try to love yourself, be gentle with yourself. You know, I I think take care of each other. I think God would want us to take care of each other. Well, as far as that statement goes, he does want us to take care of each other. But is that all God is, your own inner voice? Just be good to yourself? Not according to Genesis chapter 3. Notice also, we struggle to fulfill our God-given purpose and role now. In Genesis 1.28, we see this. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God's mandate to us is that we should multiply, make more people, and that we should rule, not in domineering, heavy-handed, 
oppressive ways, but in caretaking, liberating, gracious ways. We should care for his creation and use it to produce good things for his glory. But now look what happens because of our sin. You will have pain in childbearing. In pain you'll bring forth children. Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you. Sweat of your brow. So that which God intended for us to do is now a struggle. It's painful. It's not easy. Even our ability to fulfill the intent God has for us now, because of our rebellion, is broken. We struggle to do it. Nature still holds evidence of God's creation. We still see his glory in creation. But we also experience opposition, hardship, resistance. Because we're not put here merely as tenants, but as stewards and caretakers. Okay, now I know, so far this has been a lot of bad news. I thought it'd be good for us to end this series on like a real downer. You know, like, oh, so you come back for Easter. No, that's not the intent. The good news in the, go the gospel in Genesis is even here in what appears like bad news. God's response to human sin. How do we understand God's response to human sin? Now, last week we looked at a passage that showed us that God pursues the guilty and pronounces judgment. We are the ones who rebel. We're the ones who screw up. We're the ones who hide and cover up. And God does what? Pursues. Comes looking. Questioning. He asks, where are you? Not because he doesn't know, because he's trying to draw us out. He asks, what is this you've done? Not because he doesn't know, because he wants to draw us out. And by the way, he does that still. We're the ones who hide. Many of you are hiding right now from each other and from God. And God still pursues. God still questions. God still draws out. Why? Because he wants to punish and get you? No. Because he's loving and gracious. Even the pronouncement of judgment is not like he's happy to do it. It's the inevitable consequence of what we have done. And we have to face that if there's going to be any healing and restoration. That's what he's doing. People who have turned away and God who pursues. But notice the next what God does. In verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21, God covers sin. This is easy to miss. It's just a one, one verse. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Why did he do this? Why do they need this? Well, remember the fig leaves, right? They try to cover themselves and it's not working. God covers them with skins of animals. Why would he do this? He's covering over their sin. Our attempts to cover up our sin are wholly inadequate. Mine are. My rationalization, my excuse making, my denial, my avoidance cannot cover, and neither can yours. So what do we do? Honestly, I think most of our lives is what we're doing is just, it's like, it's like psychological and emotional fig leaves. We're trying to cover ourselves. And the message here throughout the entire Bible from Genesis 3 onward is you can't do it. In fact, the more you try to cover up, the worse it gets for you. Only God can cover your sin and his covering your sin requires a sacrifice. Look what David says in Psalm 32. And by the way, David's a guy who knew a thing or two about needing to have his sin covered over. Though he's a man after God's own heart, he's also an adulterer and a murderer. Here's what he writes. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is what? What? Covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there's no deceit. Deceit about what? About sin. When I kept silent, here's like a little commentary David has. When I kept silent about what? His sin. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Let me pause there for a minute. How many of you have felt that? You screwed up and you know it. But you don't want to admit it. 
And you can't escape that sense. I got to talk about this. I got to confess it. I want to tell my wife. I want to tell my husband. I want to tell my parents. I tell my friends. But I'm afraid and I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed and I don't know how it's going to go. And so I try to hide and cover up and rationalize. But you can't escape that heavy hand on you. And that heavy hand is not to crush you, but it's to heal you. And so we try to cover, but the beautiful irony is, as soon as we uncover ourselves before God, he covers us in his grace. Look what David says next. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Blessed is the one who is covered by God, David says. Not the one who tries to cover themselves. Your sin needs to be covered, you just can't do it. Only God can. So what's our job? Okay, Lord, okay, no more hiding, no more fig leaves, no more bushes. I'm, I'm laid bare before you. And then he covers us by his grace and his mercy. That's, that's right here in Genesis 3. It's a profound truth. And lastly, he promises redemption. Now, last week we looked at verse 15, which scholars call the proto-evangelion, meaning the first gospel, the first hint of the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you missed that, I drew lots of funny pictures. You can go back and watch that that video. Uh, But it it deals with the first word of the gospel. But there's more. Remember the Ginsu Knives commercial? But wait, there's more. There's actually more about the gospel hidden here in Genesis chapter 3 for us. Let's look at verses 22 through 24, the last verses of chapter 3 in our last passage as we finish this series. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This, this passage sounds tragic and sad, and, and it is. But there's also hidden in it glimpses of hope of our future. First of all, a couple of questions. Why does God say it's bad that man and woman have now become like him, knowing good and evil? Remember the beginning the, the, in, in Genesis 3? The serpent deceives Eve by saying what? You won't die. You'll become like God. But when we go to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, we are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The point is this. We're made to be like God through submission and obedience, not by usurping his authority and determining for ourselves what's right and wrong. So now Adam and Eve, in this case, they know good and evil, but not by obedience and surrender, by disobedience and by sin. That's, God says, for them to continue in this state, meaning we want to be the arbiters of what is right and wrong for us, I'll decide, not God. What seems right to me. That's the essence of sin. And for us to continue with eternal life, access to the tree of life, eternally, you think about it, all of humanity, for all of eternity, deciding for themselves what's right and wrong. It's really what the Bible calls hell. And God says, I'm not going to let this be the fate of all humanity. I'm going to put a stop to it. So what does he do? The tr- this is all symbolic language, right? I, we're removed from his presence. And we're, the, the tree of life is now guarded. It's not gone. It's guarded by a cherubim and a flaming sword. He sends them out. And I think... All of our lives, we're trying to get back that which we lost. My wife and I play this game sometimes. Well, I play it. She humors me. Like, uh, if you could go back to any point of our life together, what what stage of our kids would you want to relive and just kind of do? Or maybe just your life in general, right? Would you go back to college when your kids were infants? No, there's diapers. We forgot about that. That That's hard. I don't want to do that again, right? What would you you go back to junior high? No way. That was terrible. Like, what, what stage would you go back to? What's the best time in your past? When you were at your best, when life was good, where would you go back to? Even that, if we got back there, we'd realize it's not what I thought. There is, I think, in every human heart, this sense of I've lost something that I can't recover, and I long to go back to it. It is an echo of Eden in a human heart. 
that time when humanity was right before God. No hiding, no sin, no shame. And even our best moment in life isn't that, what we think it is. But it's in there. And in a way, the human struggle for meaning and significance is a way of trying to recover something we sense we've lost, we can never regain. The story of Genesis 3 is there is a way back. There is a way back. And it is through sacrifice, not yours, his. And actually, what's fascinating is in the, in the Old Testament story, God desires to live with his people from Eden all the way through. And the tabernacle, remember that? The tent of meeting where God's people would, would meet with God. And the temple were symbolic representations of his presence. And maybe you've never studied this before, but here's an image of the tabernacle, or the temple, excuse me. We'll see it here on the screen. Those, that's the priest walking into what's called the Holy of Holies. It's an artist's rendition. And the Holy of Holies was designed as the, to represent the presence of God, the most holy place. And what do you see? There's the Ark of the Covenant there where he's approaching to lay the blood uh, and the incense and the blood on the altar. And on either side of the Ark of the Covenant are two massive cherubim, huge angelic creatures. Now, we think, you, maybe you think of cherubim like cherubs, like cute babies with a, with a harp and wings. That's not what it means. Massive angelic creatures guarding the presence of God. And the temple itself, if you read through the instructions given to us in the Old Testament of how it's designed, it's designed to be like garden language. There's cherubim, there's pomegranates and palm trees. It's all meant to evoke a way back into the presence of God. Symbolically representing to God's people that you can only come into the presence of God through the sacrifice, the life of someone because of your sin. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's what covering is, atoning for, covering over of. And so there's this symbolism all throughout the Scripture that the garden, though it is guarded, it is not gone. There is a way back to God's presence. But it's not by avoiding the flaming sword, it's by going straight through it. But you can't do that. Jesus has. This is the point of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not that long from now will be a good Friday. He is the way back to the presence of God, atoning for your sin and for mine, to let us back in. The temple was the place of God's symbolic presence. The garden was the uh, place of God's unique presence. All this points again to the last book of the Bible, the last chapter. I know I've re I read this passage like all the time, but it's because there's a beautiful relationship between Genesis and Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 22 verses 1 through 5. Keep in your mind the imagery of Genesis 3 as we read this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb. The Lamb is a reference to the sacrificial death of Jesus. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, sudden reappearance of that which was guarded, now is made open to us. With its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will be anything accursed. Did you hear that? The curse, the consequence of sin, the results of our rebellion, no longer will there be anything cursed. No thorns, no thistles, no sweat, no enmity, no strife, no pride, no, no, no reigning over. but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The Lamb, the tree of life, no longer any curse. My, one of my favorite hymns at Christmas time is the hymn, Joy to the World. Do you know this hymn? Do you know that it's not a Christmas hymn, Really? It's actually a Genesis to Revelation hymn. Think about, if you remember the lyrics of that hymn, Joy to the World. Remember, let earth receive her what? King. Let every heart prepare him room. Let heaven and nature sing. And then there's this line in the third stanza. No more let sin or sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the what? Curse 
is found. Far as the curse is found, he comes to make his blessings flow. Jesus Christ is the way back to that which we have lost, and each of us knows it deep in our heart. I've lost something, and I can't quite ever regain it, and he's done it for us. You can't cover your sin. All of your efforts and my efforts to cover up are wholly inadequate, but he will cover it and forgive it and heal it and open the way for you to come back into the presence of God. This is, friends, the gospel in Genesis. And it's the perfect way for us to lead into the power of the resurrection, which is what the whole thing hangs on. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this, this ancient truth which is so profoundly relevant for us today. That when we're quiet in our soul enough and still enough, we, we hear the echo of Eden. We long for something we know we've lost. And all of our efforts to achieve and to accomplish and to be good enough and to manage our image, they're all just fig leaves, Lord. And they cannot cover. But you cover us in your grace. You cover us in your righteousness. And you usher us into your presence. And we thank you and we praise you for that, Lord Jesus. Amen. That line, who else could rescue me from my failure? Who else could send his only son? Only a holy God. That really is the gospel in Genesis. From the beginning, that God made you in love, in his image, to be in relationship with him. And we, though we turn away from him, he pursues us in love to cover our sin and invite us back. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace of the holy God. May, he, may you know him and be known by him now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.